Okay, so this is going to be our lecture uh, that I would have given you Monday after Thanksgiving break, uh, covering sections 10.1 uh, through 10.3, and those slides are available on Canvas if you want to follow along. Um, so starting with section 10.1 here um, is really setting us up for what this chapter is about, uh, and this chapter is all about intermolecular forces. So we have spent a great deal of time talking about intramolecular forces, or in other words, the forces within a molecule. And of course, we've discussed bonding, we've discussed uh, electron configuration, we've discussed orbitals. Um, so that is all intramolecular forces. Now what we're focused on is intermolecular forces. Um, which is the forces between molecules. And there are a lot of uh, physical properties that are predicted from the intermolecular forces between molecules. And so the easiest place to start with that is to, um, to think about something uh, ubiquitous like water. And another thing that we can, another term we can use for intermolecular forces is also the interactive forces, so the way that the molecules are interacting with each other. And there is a, a nice relationship between the kinetic energy of molecules and their interactions. So if we think about this um, ice cube here, this solid uh, water, it's going to have the lowest kinetic energy compared to, uh, let's say, a liquid or the gas, the steam coming off of this cup of coffee. Um, and because there's the lowest kinetic energy, the interactive forces are the highest. In other words, the molecules don't have a lot of motion as they have a, a low kinetic energy. So that allows them to really interact strongly with each other. And that scales with phase. So a solid um, will have the highest interactions uh, between molecules. A liquid will be uh, intermediate and then uh, a gas will have the lowest interactive forces, and that's because the kinetic energy is the highest, so these molecules are moving around quite chaotically, so there's no chance really for these gas molecules to interact. And if you call an ideal gas law, right, there is no interaction. Okay, so moving forward, let's do a few definitions. Um, and in section 10.2, we're going to focus on just dispersion forces. And uh, sometimes we refer to that as uh, London dispersion forces, or sometimes just London forces, or sometimes just dispersion forces. So all of those are equivalent terms. Um, so a London dispersion force is the force between nonpolar molecules caused by the presence of uh, temporary dipoles in the molecules, or sometimes we call that a temporary induced dipole. And that is the separation of charges produced in an atom or molecule by a momentary uneven distribution of electrons. Um, so we talked about that a little bit actually in our gas laws chapter, um, but as a reminder, if we think of the simple example here of uh, H2, the H2 molecule. And so if these molecules are well separated, um, they won't have any interaction between each other. Okay, so we'll also write no interaction. But as they move closer together, um, then they're going to start interacting. So they start interacting. And then what they can do is induce a temporary instantaneous dipole um, on, let's say, molecule A, where now this is showing you this shaded region with this partial negative charge. Um, all the electrons jump to one side, causing this dipole, right, which we would draw in this direction. Right? The positive side uh, gets a positive sign, and then it points to the negative side. And then now, if this molecule moves close enough to this molecule, this induces a dipole moment in the other molecule. And now we have a dipole moment pointing this way, temporary one, and a dipole moment 
pointing this way and this will allow these two molecules to actually uh, stick together or interact for some brief period of time. And it's important to note this is a rather weak interaction and that is evidenced by the boiling points. And so if, for example, we look at boiling points of the series of noble gases, and keep in mind, we can talk about dispersion forces or intermolecular forces between um, atoms or between that of molecules. And of course, we recognize the noble gases are stable as atoms. Um, even so, they're nonpolar. And you can see that, that the dispersion forces are very weak given these observed boiling points. So for example, helium boils at four Kelvin. In other words, it only takes four Kelvin to start to separate uh, helium atoms in a liquid and make them a gas. So that extremely low boiling point is an indication of the very weak forces between the molecule, okay? And similarly with neon, it uh, is 27 Kelvin. But now you notice when we move up, or I should say when we move down the periodic table, right? This is moving down the table. The boiling points are increasing rather dramatically. And that's actually because uh, once you start getting a bunch of electrons, for example, with xenon being 54 electrons or radon even being 86 electrons, um, this dispersion force can actually become quite strong. I mean, radon with a boiling point of 211 Kelvin, that's um, quite large. And so again, you know, if we had one of our noble gases, let's say xenon, right, interacting in close proximity with another xenon, um, then all of the electrons would migrate to one side, leaving that partially positive and leaving that partially negative which would also induce another dipole in a neighboring xenon atom. So then the positive and the negative attract. Uh, and this is why you actually see such a steep increase in boiling points um, with these noble gases, because as, as the atom gets more and more electrons, the dispersion forces become more and more important. And that's also evidenced in the boiling point trend of the halogens, so here again moving down the table, we see a fluorine, chlorine, bromine, and so on. And you notice their boiling points also show a similar trend as the noble gases, whereas fluorine will boil at 85 Kelvin, meaning at room temperature, so if I write this extra column, at room temp here, um, this is a gas. And chlorine would also be a gas at room temperature because it boils at 239 Kelvin. But bromine would actually be a liquid at room temperature. So remember, room temperature is 298 Kelvin. Um, so bromine is starting to get um, massive and bulky enough. This is showing you the molar masses. But really, this effect is driven largely by the number of electrons. Um, and actually, as it turns out, iodine is in fact a solid at room temperature. So this is uh, 457 Kelvin is its boiling point um, and its melting point, as I recall, is somewhere around 360 Kelvin. Um, and then of course, uh, we see that effect even further as we continue to move down the table. So even though these disp dispersion forces are generally weak, they can actually become quite strong um, when you have a molecule with a large number of electrons, or as I'll show you in the next slide, there are structural elements to a molecule that really drive its observed boiling point. And so here are the series of hydrocarbons. Those of you that go on to take organic chemistry will know these as the alkanes. Okay, so here, for example, we start with butane which is four carbons, pentane is five, six carbons, seven carbons, and eight carbons, all the way up to octane. You guys know octane really well, right? This is principal component of gasoline. And so you notice here, the boiling point of octane is quite large. In fact, it's larger than the boiling point of water because this molecule is getting so big and, and bulky, 
it interacts with other neighboring octane molecules in a rather strong way. And also the structural details of these molecules uh, follow such that as they keep getting larger, they get um, a lot more floppy, as I like to describe. And they can actually interact with each other kind of like spaghetti noodles. So you imagine a couple spaghetti noodles that become to get intertwined with each other. And that makes them quite difficult to separate, um, which is why they have a large boiling point. And you can see how the boiling point scales as you add on extra carbons. Okay. And so these are all the um, what are called normal or uh, the, the long chain version. Um, but there are other ways to view this. So shape is important to dispersion forces. So if I look at this series of um, hydrocarbons that contain five carbon atoms, and if I start with pentane, one, two, three, four, five carbon atoms, all arranged in this chain, we would call this normal pentane or in pentane, um, you can see its boiling point is quite large, 309 Kelvin. Um, and that's because this long shape, this you know kind of long skinny shape can pack in the most efficient way, right? So if I have kind of a long like hot dog shape, it can pack with another long hot dog shape and so on and so forth. And there's minimal space between those molecules. Right? You can even imagine getting another one crammed into that location and so on. But now if I look at a 2-methylbutane, which again is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 carbons, it's not spread out in a long chain like this, and so it has a difficult time with its packing efficiency. And so you can see its boiling point is slightly less than that of normal pentane, and even uh, more so when I look at 2,2-dimethylpropane, and again, you don't have to know how to do these names. This is for the folks that go on to take uh, OCHEM. Uh, this molecule is kind of shaped like a circle, and you can't pack spherical or circular shaped objects together as efficiently as elongated shapes, right? If I try to pack a bunch of circular shapes together, there's more space between them than there is with these oval shapes. And you can see that it actually drives the boiling point way down. So again, the, the higher the boiling point something is, the stronger its intermolecular forces are or the stronger its interactions are. And shape is important. Okay, moving on. We now move into section 10.3, which will be the last section uh, covered by this lecture. We now start thinking of the interactions amongst polar molecules. Uh, there's a few things to consider. One is the ion dipole interaction, and that's an attractive force between an ion and a molecule that has a permanent dipole moment. So, none of this induced dipole moment stuff. Um, we might recognize that this should actually be a very strong interaction. And in fact, this is the strongest of all of our intermolecular force interactions. And I'll summarize all of these together at the end. And so here's an example of this. We imagine that a cube of salt, a, a salt crystal here, and those are held together quite strongly by the negative positive interaction, right? Well, similarly, if I dissolve the salt and water, um, then we remember the Lewis structure of water, or I should really say the Vesper shape, right? It has this tetrahedral shape that we predicted to be very polar, right? So we see that. We see that in the case of the sodium, the negatively charged oxygen atoms are aligning with the positive cation, right? That dotted line indicates the ion-dipole interaction. And in the case of uh, chloride, the chloride ions, the positively charged hydrogens are aligned with the negatively charged ion. And so again, opposites attract. Um, and this is why water is able to dissolve salt so readily. Okay. And so another definition, the sphere of hydration, the cluster of water molecules surrounding an ion in an aqueous solution. Um, well, this is what we might call the inner sphere of hydration. And I can show you another picture of that here. 
So here, this this darker blue, it might be hard to kind of see that, but I'll kind of draw it around here. This might be our inner sphere of hydration, where the first few water molecules, the ones that are in direct contact with the ion, are being showed. Um, and then we would have our outer sphere, which would be something like this. And then those outer sphere are the next layer. You notice here the way this works, right? Here's the first mono layer, and then here's the second mono layer. And then finally, you get to what we would just refer to as bulk water, the regular old water that doesn't have any ions dissolved in it. And you can see something similar with the anion. Here we have our inner sphere of hydration, followed by our outer sphere. And then finally, you get to the bulk waters, OK? And all of these are lined up um, by the permanent dipole moments that exist between the water molecules and the ion. And so now moving on, another type of interaction amongst polar molecules is the dipole-dipole interaction. And that's just the attractive force between polar molecules. And of course, these are molecules which contain a permanent dipole moment. And what we were just talking about with that sphere of hydration, you can see if I look at the interaction amongst two water molecules, it's going to follow in the same geometric Vesper theory. That's why it's showing this one as being bent at this angle and this one being bent at this angle. And again, the negatives and the positives are going to line up. And this is a rather strong interaction, right? Water boils at 100 degrees C. And that's a fairly large boiling point in the grand scheme of things. Okay. Um, and then another type of interaction amongst polar molecules is the dipole-induced dipole interaction. And that's the attraction between a polar molecule and the oppositely charged pole it temporarily induces in another molecule. So this is similar to what's going on in London dispersion forces. However, the difference here is that one of the molecules is already polar. For example, if we imagine the interaction between uh, water and let's say O2, we note that water is a polar molecule, and here you can see the dipole moment, but O2 is not a polar molecule. However, when oxygen and H2O start interacting, water can actually induce a temporary dipole on the oxygens such that um, even this oxygen could be attracted to the negatively charged oxygen on this side. And this is actually why um, oxygen can be dissolved in liquid water. Uh, we're going to talk about that um, probably on uh, Wednesday's lecture. But um, we can, in fact, have some gases that are soluble in liquids because of this dipole-induced dipole interaction. OK, and so this leads us to the very famous type of dipole-dipole interaction that we call the hydrogen bond. And note, this is not formally a bond like we discussed previously with uh, molecular orbital theory and valence bond theory. The hydrogen bond is specifically the dipole-dipole interaction between that of hydrogen and any molecule containing oxygen, nitrogen, and fluorine only. So you don't see hydrogen bonding to, let's say, a hydrogen and a carbon or hydrogen and a beryllium. It's to a hydrogen and a neighboring oxygen, nitrogen, or fluorine. So for example, here's acetic acid. And you know this is one acetic acid molecule right here, right? And here's another acetic acid molecule right here. And those two can attract each other quite strongly because the hydrogen in this bond, right? This is a hydrogen-oxygen single bond can create the H bond to a neighboring oxygen. And this hydrogen can create an H bond to this neighboring oxygen. Right? So again, just to draw that out so you can see what's happening here. So this is our normal sigma bond. Our hydrogen bond exists between that of the other molecule, right? And then here is the other neighboring uh, hydrogen bond, okay?
And H bonding is extremely important in nature and particularly in biology. The really famous example of this is hydrogen bonding and DNA. So this is the double helix backbone of DNA, right? Here's one helix and then there's the other helix. And these two backbones are attached via the base pairs, right? A, T, G, and C, adenine, thymine, guanine, and cytosine. Just to note that those are the same letters that are shown in the picture, right? And so what you see here is, for example, in this guanine molecule, there's a nitrogen-hydrogen single bond, and then it has a hydrogen bond to the neighboring oxygen atom. And then similarly, and this is all within the same molecule, right? This is the same base pair right here. It has another nitrogen-hydrogen sigma bond, and then it can make a uh, hydrogen bond to the neighboring nitrogen. And then similarly, there's a third hydrogen bond from this oxygen to the neighboring hydrogen. So that's really what keeps these DNA base pairs kind of glued together. It's also what keeps water stuck together as a liquid. Uh, so hydrogen binding is really important in nature. And um, I actually have another picture of that with water showing you the structural differences between ice and liquid. So in liquid water, it's chaotic, so the, they're constantly breaking and reforming. However, because of this tetrahedral geometry, it's quite easy for a water molecule to find another neighboring water molecule to make a hydrogen bond, which exists between the hydrogens and a neighboring oxygen. Um, but when water forms ice, it actually makes this really nice regular structure. We call that the crystal structure. And you might notice like this, this shape, we call that a dendritic shape. You could see that expanded out to like a normal uh, ice crystal. If we were to expand this out, we're zoomed way into like the single molecule size. But if we expand it out, um, we see this structure repeating itself in, in an actual ice uh, crystal, which is kind of neat. Okay, and then to summarize um, what we would observe, so here is a bunch of different molecules, all made from the different groups. If I move from, uh, you know, groups across the table or within uh, the same group, and I look at the boiling point, I can see exactly what we've discussed. We see H2O, HF, ammonia, and methane. And what's really interesting this, if you look at this, what you would actually expect is H2O and HF to be in a different position. So this creates an exception. You would actually expect H2O to have a lower boiling point than HF based on the way these electronegativity scale, right? Carbon, nitrogen, should be oxygen, then fluorine. However, water makes an exception, and that's because of the large number of hydrogen bonds it can form. Um, and then the rest of the scales, um, as you might expect. And then with methane, methane doesn't make hydrogen bonds at all. So it exists not only as a gas at room temperature, but look, its boiling point is somewhere around negative you know, 150. Um, and so now, if I look at the next series over, uh, starting with uh, silicone tetrahydride, right? So now this trend gets rather interesting. Um, because it starts to follow what you would expect, right? Uh, silicone tetrahydride is very similar to methane, um, except for because silicone is bigger, right? Silicone has more electrons. Uh, it can actually participate in stronger dispersion forces than methane can. So it has a higher boiling point. And similarly, if I look at now germanium tetrahydride, germanium, has more electrons, so it has stronger dispersion forces, and same with tin tetrahydride. So you can see that trend with the um, H4 groups, right? Starting with CH4, SiH4, uh, germanium H4, and 10H4. So those are increasing because of dispersion forces. But now, this is rather interesting when you look at the next uh, series. If we look at ammonia, um, again, you can kind of detect a little bit of an exception here, 
where now instead of the trend going that the boiling point increases, the boiling point decreases because what's also at play here is size. So in other words, if I compare a pH 3 to an NH3, they'll have the same Lewis structure. Okay, so recall ammonia has a, right, a lone pair on the nitrogen. Well, so too will phosphorus. And so then you might expect it to have an increased boiling point, but it actually has a decreased boiling point. And the reason for that is because ammonia is very small and it can pack really efficiently compared to pH 3. And that actually makes a really big difference in the dipole-dipole interaction. So size really makes a difference here. And, and because the nitrogen is so much smaller, um, it can pack together more efficiently and thus has a higher boiling point. And you see that trend also with HF compared to HCl. And you also see that trend with H2O compared to H2S, that these boiling points drive way down because these molecules are quite small. They pack together very efficiently. But now continuing along with this trend, um, we see another instance here where we expect sulfur to be lower than that of chlorine, but it's the opposite. Uh, and again, that's related to the number of hydrogen bonds. H2S can make more hydrogen bonds than HCl. Um, and then if we move up to this next trend right here, okay, what we see is now exceptions Within the exceptions, right, we should see HBr being the highest one, uh, but that's not the case. So I won't um, be too picky about holding you responsible to understanding why those exceptions exist. But we can see the general trend is there. And if, I, if we move up to the final row here, um, you can see now it mirrors the same thing that we had with water, fluorine, nitrogen, and carbon. Okay, and then finally the last summary here and I'll zoom out so we can see this whole picture. So if I look at all of the uh, forces, all the intermolecular forces and how they compare with each other, dispersion is by far the weakest and that was noted um, from the halogens and even the noble gases. The dipole induced dipole is the second weakest. The dipole dipole uh, comes about in the middle, and again with dipole-dipole, um, that explains why something like this molecule that contains the ability to hydrogen bond has a higher boiling point than this nonpolar molecule. Hydrogen bonding is extremely strong, um, but it is not as strong as the ion-dipole interaction. Okay, so I think that pretty much concludes all I wanted to discuss here. So uh, just make sure that you don't have any questions and that you watch this lecture. Uh, if you need to watch it again, please do. And uh, we'll continue on uh, with 10.4 on Wednesday.